All right, well, very good Wednesday morning to all of you. My name is Miles Glancy. I am the general manager of Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra and Choral. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of Jews and Music Online with scholar in residence, Francesco Spagnolo. And today featuring Varetsky Pass members, Cookie Siegelstein and Josh Horwitz, uh, and also featuring recorded performances of Philharmonia Baroque chamber players and discussion from music director Richard Egar and PBO cellist William Skeen. Uh, we are using the Zoom webinar platform for this event. So your video camera and microphone are disabled throughout. So we're unable to see you or hear you. If you have any questions for our panelists throughout the event, you can feel free to submit them by using the Q&A button, which is in the bottom frame of your screen if you're using a computer. We'll try and get to your questions at the end. If you need assistance at any time, you can use the chat feature down below or you can email info at philharmonia.org. With any live streamed event, we may experience some connectivity issues and sound or video blips, and we apologize in advance if that does happen, and we thank you for your patience. And finally, a special mark your calendars announcement for all of you. PBO will, will be releasing its very first socially distanced chamber music salon recorded safely on the stage of Herbst Theater this Tuesday, November 24th at 8 p.m. Pacific. Entitled Bach, The Unanswered Question, this performance will feature Philharmonia Baroque chamber players, and you are able to get a sneak peek of them playing together in today's program. More information is on our website at philharmonia.org. I would now like to introduce PBO's Executive Director, Courtney Beck. Thanks, Miles. Boy, this is quite the crowd for 11 o'clock on a Wednesday, and it's wonderful to have everybody here. Welcome. And welcome to Klezmer and Baroque. Thanks so much for tuning in. I believe this actually marks the 65th virtual event that PBO has put on since July. And we're so glad to see you today for the next installment of Jews and Music's Jam Online. Our Jam Online digital programs have been very popular and are made possible with generous support from the Karat Foundation, the Rossi Armstrong and Jonas J.K. Stern Jews and Music Fund, the Gaia Fund, the Marmor Foundation, the Bernard Osher Foundation, and the Bloom Music Foundation. Jews and Music was created as a way to understand the relationships between Jews and non-Jews and the rich tradition and the creation of music and art and the social and political milieus that influenced and continue to influence composition, literature, visual art, and performance. JAM covers the past, the present, and the future. And we are the mo only major American orchestra with a dedicated program focused on this unique subject matter. And we do hope that you'll support our continuing work. Today's program is led by PBO Jews and Music scholar in residence, Francesco Spagnolo, who's played a vital role in our JAM program since the beginning, including on tour to Harvard, Yale, University of Chicago and Dartmouth, and the upcoming tour to the Metropolitan Museum of Art next September. He's a multidisciplinary scholar focusing on Jewish studies, music, and digital media. And at UC Berkeley, he's the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. And we are delighted to welcome today Cookie Siegelstein and Joshua Horowitz from the celebrated Klezmer Varetsky Pass. Named after Varetsky Pass, the mountain pass through which Magyar tribes crossed into the Carpathian Basin to settle what later became the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Francesco and Cookie Siegelstein and Josh Horowitz as they explore the intersection of early music and Klezmer repertoires presented as table music. Thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney, Miles, Jeff, the whole PBO for uh, hosting uh, this series, making it possible uh, as we were doing a tech rehearsal. And hello, Cookie and, and Josh. Hey, Francesco and everybody. You know, we, we are, we're sort of neighbors in Berkeley, but we haven't <laughs> seen each other in person in a while. So it's good to be in the same uh, Zoom chamber uh, <laughs> together. And, uh, and we were just talking about the fact that what we're doing with this series and, and leveraging uh, the Zoom platform and the ability to connect with various people close and far away is we're having sort of like these uh, monthly, weekly uh, Zoom dreams in which we dream of possibilities for the future. And, and so what we're hearing today is, uh, first of all, a lot of very interesting and, and, and beautiful music. Uh, we are looking at convergence at, at uh, repertoires that kind of may work in parallel or very much in tandem. 
so we, we have music performed as, as, as Courtney was announcing by the PBO chamber players and by Veretsky Pass, uh, Kugi Sigelstein and, 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 and uh, Josh Horowitz. And we are uh, focusing not so much on the idea that Klezmer and Baroque uh, repertoires meet one another, but very specifically at one type of repertoire, that of table music. And this is an idea that struck me years ago, and I'm really delighted that we have a chance to experiment with it. So each, uh, each uh, uh, music uh, unit has contributed repertoires to try and find synergies. But the idea is that since the early modern period, um, the rubric of table music known in Europe as either tafel music or music de, de table um, is, is, is a, it's kind of like a context in which a variety of musical repertoires can be played with and against each other. What we, what we will hear is uh, vocal music turn into instrumental music, uh, vocal music turn into instrument music, into instrument music, and then back to vocal and back to instrumental. We'll, 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 we'll go through all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, permutations of musical repertoires. Uh, the idea of table music is, is in, in, initiates with entertaining the court, the aristocracy, uh, and so composers bringing together various repertoires. But there, there is one point that I want to make before we start listening to, to beautiful music, which is that it's mu music for the table means music designed specifically for listening. So it's an early form of really focusing on the musical content and not on the activities that music elicit, especially dance. We'll see how vocal dance and instrumental repertoires all kind of come together uh, in, in, this, in this context. And we've uh, investigated repertoires in, in the klezmer repertoire, historical klezmer repertoires, and uh, early music repertoires, Baroque repertoires, with, uh, with our musicians uh, today. Uh, the idea is that by entertaining courts and then transferring this into outside of the world of the aristocracy into the middle class, uh, table music is also acting as a leveler in, uh, in, uh, in social uh, differences, uh, sort of as a, as a bridge between social classes, and as we hope to, to show today, also between cultures. Uh, we'll see how both repertoires really share in, in, this, in this way. And actually, as a reminder, and maybe Mouse can bring in a few of the images that we uh, collected to introduce and kind of get us into, into, uh, the, into the, the topic uh, today. Um, one of the earliest uh, collections of table music was called Divertimento dei Granti, and some of in the audience, uh, in the audiences of uh, uh, of uh, Philharmonia Baroque, know a bit about this piece. We we talked about it a few weeks ago. Um, it's it's a collection uh, uh, published in in Venice in the uh, 1680s, and uh, it includes also it's it's a collection of table music, includes uh, vocal music, etc., and it also includes one of the earliest pieces of Hebrew uh, uh, text set to musical notation that we know of. It was written by composer Carlo Grossi. And so the idea is that in a way table music is really a foundational concept in the types of synergies we're exploring. We know that, uh, that uh, it's music and I hear a little bit of background noise, so I don't know where it's coming from, but uh, chair. yeah, maybe a chair. Thank you, Josh. And, but we know that it's music that was produced so we can go through the, the, just a few of the images to entertain different types of chords. From, uh, from the Elizabethan uh, court. And I think we have a slide for that that our music director, Richard Agar, uh, suggested we, we share uh, today, but also uh, Hasidic courts. And, uh, and here is a more contemporary depiction. We, in the next slide, we see uh, more contemporary uh, depictions of, of, of what a, a Hasidic table is. It's, it's a table for eating, but it's also a table for performing. Uh, many of the people that we see in the, in the audience uh, around this table will eventually, during the, the, the ceremony around the, the rabbi's table, perform and jump on the table and sing and dance and, 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 and perform there. And then we have a long tradition of table music entering the uh, ecosystem of the traditional East European Jewish wedding. Uh, and we have a couple of images here that, uh, that follow. This is a, an early 18th century uh, copper plate and grave where we see the musicians accompanying the processional. And we see how people are all dressed up, not just for the wedding, but in a way, uh, the, the Jewish wedding is, is a form of uh, matching Jewish society with what the aristocracy was doing 
at the time. And we know that Jewish musicians entertained at Jewish weddings and in non-Jewish weddings and East European aristocracy as well. So the music that we're presenting today reflects this. And we, I think we have also another painting from the Magnus Collection in UC Berkeley that, that shows how the musicians are omnipresent in the, in the Jewish wedding. So the, the, the top uh, classical musicians would uh, accompany not just the whole Jewish wedding from processionals to, of course, dance, dance uh, parties and, and, and so on, but also specifically play at the table of the in-laws, of the notable uh, guests at, at the wedding, music specifically designed to, uh, to, to be listened to and not to be danced uh, to. Uh, Veretsky Pass, as Courtney has said, is, uh, you know, we, we have legendary musicians today. So uh, I remember when I moved to the Bay Area, uh, eventually finding my way and knocking on the door of, of, of George, uh, Josh Horowitz, who I knew as a, as a lily, a, a, a legend and a deacon in, in the in knowledge of East European music. And he and Kuki Sigosin had been investigating, developing, publishing incredible amounts of repertoire. So the, the and, and guys help me out here, but the, what you're presenting today is sort of like subsets of the various repertoires and, and, and albums that you've been publishing in the last few years. So they are backed up by solid research in 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 uh, in uh, written sources, and then elaborated in in uh, and and so you create sets in which you combine different aspects of the repertoires that you investigate. Do you wanna do you wanna uh, share with with us what you're going to play just now and where where the music comes from? And thank you again for joining us, of course. Oh, thanks for having us. Sure. Uh, so do you wanna? Um... Tell, say what we're doing? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having us, and thanks to the whole audience for being here. Um, well, first of all, I was asked to explain what this instrument is. It's called a cymbal, and it has 105 strings on it. So the uh, common adage among cymbal players is that we spend half our lives tuning and the other half playing out of tune. Um, it has a, a bridge in the middle which divides the string into a perfect fifth. Um, which means that the instrument, because of the way it's constructed, is not a tempered instrument, but it's also not um, uh, connected to any tuning system. Um, so we're going to play at the very beginning an improvisation called a doina. Uh, this is something, in fact, it, it's, it, in Romanian lore, it's called a doina chobanul, or a doina of the shepherd variety. And this has a specific meaning to Jews, especially around the late 19th century, that um, there's a kind of an allegory that exists of a shepherd who, who um, loses his sheep and goes in search of them and eventually finds them. And that story is an analogy to the Jews in the diaspora, the Jews that have been um, ousted from, from the temple in the year 70, and are considered the sheep, so to speak, seeking then to come home to the land of Israel or to God. And, um, and so this, this kind of improvisation that we're going to play, which was typically played um, in a certain period, late 19th century, um, was something that would, might be played for the rabbi or for people as a kind of device to meditate on, on this particular fact of the diaspora. So it's an improvisation and you can hear it has a device in it where it kind of goes into major a little bit. And this is the point where um, in the texts that exist that have been set to this kind of form or this melody, you would find that this is the point where the shepherd finds the sheep, but it kind of goes back and forth. And then after that, it goes straight into a song that is um, called the Song of the Wanderer by the neighboring people of Jews, uh, especially the Hutzel uh, people. And so we've kind of juxtaposed a, a, a wedding type of song that exists in that culture because this is something that Jews would actually, a type of thing that Jews would play. And for those of you who know about phrase structure, they are six bar phrases. So it, the second tune, when it actually goes into this rhythmic thing, sounds very elliptical. Okay.
switch to, um, Josh is going to pick up his accordion. And the next little set that we're going to play is uh, actually uh, taken from a Hasidic march. Uh, the Hasidim love marches and borrowed a lot from uh, military marches. Um, and then we're going to go into um, kind of a composition arrangement of mine taken from some Moldavian Hasidic tunes. And uh, so this is called Three Horses March. And for want of a better, better title, we call the next one Golda Malka, which is my Yiddish name, in Moldavanka. So. So by the way, the um, the Hasidic Nagunim, the, the uh, pieces that you hear that the Hasidim, the, the Orthodox Hasidic Jews sing, um, often are done with uh, syllables rather than words. There are actually three levels of that. The first level um, is where you sing in the vernacular language, such as Yiddish. The second higher level is where you sing in Hebrew or Aramaic. And the third level is where there are no languages at all, and you hear things like "di di 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 di." Thank you, and and thank you for for um, deploying your entire arsenal of instruments, uh, uh, Josh, and 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 switching from the cymbal to the button accordion, and uh, and uh, maybe later on as we listen to more of your repertoire, Cookie you will give us some pointers about the use of vibrato, or or lack thereof, and you know just a few ideas about performing style. Um, in, in, in an ideal Zoom world, uh, um, our colleague and PBO music director, Richard Agar, would have been with us today. And so we would have been conversing about the music together and dreaming up uh, future programs and, and, and synergies. But he, he was caught up in, in between time zones and instead he recorded a video 
uh, for us. And he, uh, in the video, he explains the selections we're about to listen to performed by, by PBO chamber players and, and why across the entire uh, uh, sea of uh, table music he picked specifically these repertoires. So here's Richard Agar. Greetings from my office in Amsterdam. Sorry not to be with you live. Uh, I'm sure you'll have a great time and a great discussion. Uh, just here to introduce the pieces of classical music that you'll hear uh, in this program. And just also to talk about tough music a little bit. Uh, I think our, maybe our image of music to be played during food is maybe slightly coloured by pretty bad movies of medieval banquets with people throwing food and musicians dressed in silly clothes in the background. That's probably not entirely untrue, but it's probably not the whole truth either. Certainly by the end of the 16th century, um, music for dining uh, occasions was becoming more serious. There's wonderful music by Praetorius in collections like Terpsichore, which were, were dance music, but the dance music was also the music that people would perhaps listen to when eating. Um, some great, great music, but it's not profound or deep or music which, uh, which would make you really think. This changed around at the beginning of the 17th century, and we have collections like Schein's Banchetto Musicale, which contain fantastic pieces of music. Uh, and it's music that I'm sure people when they were eating, sat down and listened to uh, with some thought. And uh, all, always music for food has been, it depends on the, the, the place and the time. Um, most musicians at this time, of course, were either employed by the church or by a court, an elector or a, a margrave or whatever it was, or royalty. Uh, so for different, different kind of food occasions, different kind of food uh, uh, occasions, music would be appropriately written. Um, and these pieces from uh, the Banchetto Musicale are gorgeous, gorgeous examples of that. Um, they are in five parts, so two violas, two violins and a bass line with continuo if, if necessary. I think another thing about the tough music, it, is, it was very um, flexible. Certainly the 16th century, the, the, the music I mentioned by Praetorius, you have a score and you have parts. Um, mostly parts, not always a score in fact, so you, you played from parts, and those parts could be taken by whoever was around, so it was a very flexible uh, working environment. You could play it with whatever you had around the quarters, or gambas, or violins, or whatever whatever was around, or reed instruments. Um, the shine is, is a little bit more prescriptive, because it's it's become string music, and we have a, a good example here from shine, um, and it's quite a rich meal, uh, to digest because of these five parts. Uh, it's a, a, a typical pa Paduana and Galliard, a pavan. Uh, now a pavan is always in three sections with, with repeats and a Galliard similarly. Um, and that gives the, the musicians an opportunity also to have a second go through each section and to improvise a little bit and add decoration. And these are beautiful, beautiful pair of pieces from, from uh, Schein's Banchetto Musicale. The other music is Dowland's Paduan, which is the same as a Pavan, and Volta. We have a lovely picture of Queen Elizabeth I dancing the Volta. And that was a dance a little bit like the Galliard. It had uh, involved, it was quite energetic and involved turns and lifts. And it's a great, great picture to, 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 to see uh, of Elizabeth I dancing the Volta. And again, this is real musicians' music. It's, it's high quality music. So in a way, there's, there's sort of two types of music being produced for banquets. There's the stuff which is just a bit, little bit like McDonald's. You know, it's, it's sort of fast, fast food, um, stuff that's not necessarily there to be um, listened to attentively. And there's also this music which is starting to come in in the 17th century, which is much more food for thought. We have this expression, food for thought. And this is music for thought, and it's, I'm sure it's music that people listen to. And this Dowland, uh, it's a fantastic uh, pair of pieces from Thomas Simpson's Tafel Consort of 1621. This is only a four-part scoring, so two violins, viola and bass. Uh, 
wonderful, wonderful music, really, really high quality music and something which any educated listener would, would really enjoy and it would feed them emotionally and spiritually, which is a very important part of what tough music became. Uh, when we now have later examples by Bieber and also um, Telemann, big, big production by Telemann, three huge volumes of tough music for specific instrumentation. And that's really on a grand banquet scale and not music to be uh, um, put in the background. That's really in the foreground. So that was something that people would definitely have listened to. That's the music you'll hear, played by our wonderful musicians, Catherine Keim, Noah Strick on violins, Maria Caswell and Aaron Westman on viola, William Skeen on viola de gamba, and Kathy Heater on harpsichord. So enjoy this banquet and I hope it feeds your soul deliciously. I'm sure it does. It's uh, 
it's actually a, a delight to see uh, PBO's musicians uh, perform again on a stage and uh, uh, and of course connect with your uh, uh, living room, uh, Cookie and, and Josh. It's uh, it's great to it's really great to be uh, together on this occasion. Um, I, we were talking earlier about the fact that when it comes to table music, in both contexts we are examining today, and 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 Richard was with his words was reinforcing that message, we have a context in which various repertoires seems to come together. In, in the case of Klezmer, we are, we're looking at um, Hasidic repertoires, as, as Josh explained earlier, uh, vocal repertoires. So singing with words, without words, uh, the, the code name is Nigan, as in, as in the melody, and, uh, but also synagogue repertoires and of course, instrumental repertoires. And sometimes, in, in especially in the, Klezmer, in the Klezmer context, vocal repertoires are transformed into, into instrumental music. And the, the work that Veretsky Tass does is kind of collate and find synergies among these repertoires. But we kind of understand, our under, historical understanding is that, and this goes back several centuries. So even though we don't have, of course, musical transcriptions or recordings that match the music of Shine or Dalin that we're presenting with PBO. We don't have Jewish music written uh, for Klezmer in, 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 in that period. Our understanding is really that these repertoire, repertoires used to, to mesh and mix uh, together. So right now you're, you're focusing specifically in the next set on music from Poland and, and a project you, 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 you did a few, a few years ago where exactly these various repertoires are coming together. Can you just give us a, a hint of what we're about to listen? So we're going to um, mix and mash, which is what we love to do, um, a collected, a, a germ of a collected song by Oscar Kohlberg, a monk in the 1800s who went through the lands and collected all kinds of, from all the regions of, of the Polish uh, lands, um, melodies, jokes, stories. And this one uh, snippet, which was about six notes called I Went Away is what he called one of the very few Jewish tunes that he collected. We then go into two Hasidic um, tunes, one from that was collected by um, Idelson in probably the early 20th century, and another one that was a little bit later uh, by Uri Sharvit. And we arranged and composed around these to make basically a suite. So that's what you're gonna hear. Okay, here we go.
Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, this is so wonderful, and I, I I really feel I should pull my Polish vodka out of the freezer uh, <laughs> to, to accompany what you are performing. Um, and speaking of performance, Cookie, I, I snatched the promise from you that you would address the topic of, of, of vibrato. And in the meantime, we're also being joined by Bill Skeen, William Skeen of uh, PBO's. Uh, uh, hi, Bill. Hello. <laughs> and so that we can together think a bit about performance practice. Cookie, what about vibrato? What, what, what says you? So um, there is no indication um, that historically uh, people used vibrato or didn't. If they were well-trained, they did. If they weren't well-trained, maybe they didn't. But what we do is we kind of um, choose some stylistic elements from some of the recordings of, say, co-territorial performances. So what I do is I use regular vibrato as an ornament at the end of a slower tune but what I, the, the trill that I use is a vibrato trill. So if I play a note, even in, especially in a fast tune, I'll actually do a vibrato trill. So uh, sometimes people think it's a very wobbly vibrato, and yes it is. Um, and that's, you know, specifically the kind of trill I do whenever I'm trilling. I'll also do a turn, da-da-da, sometimes, and we do a, um, what would be called in the jazz world a ghost tone. We call it a crax, which is the catch, the sob in the cat of in the voice. And that's stop the tone with a with a neutral finger. So is three things in once, a slide, a crax, and a trill. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the major um, ornaments that we use in this. Thank you, Bill. It was so great to see you and 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 other players from PBO uh, on a stage. And uh, I I was wondering what were you what 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 kind of thinking goes into an historically informed performance of table music? Does the idea of a of a social setting uh, change the way you approach uh, technical aspects like vibratos and trills and in general the the general pace of the performance? This, right. was not, this was not music designed for the stage, even though you are on a stage when you present it today. Right, so right. How, well, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, well, funny enough, I mean, most of my colleagues would, would assume when you say you're playing banquet music or tuffle music that it, as, you know, Richard was saying, it's, you know, it's thought of as McDonald's music, you know, something we can just toss off and, and not pay attention to what we're doing. Um, when it is actually the opposite of that. Um, and... Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of what we would do differently is, uh, you know, we would approach this music the same beautiful way no matter what. I mean, it's vocal music with instrumental ornamentation added to it, especially on the repeats. And so I, I just think that when um, when we're, you know, putting this piece forward, uh, you'll, you'll hear on the, on the recording just uh, a, a lot of ornamentation. So that's really where it's at um, in terms of how we would think of it differently. I just think that a modern approach to it is that um, we wouldn't we wouldn't take it as seriously, but now we will, knowing how important you know giving it the title of banquet music or tuffle music is. Um, uh, and I think I think maybe if played not in that context, just sort of as background music, you might hear a, a lot more ornamentation on the repeats, just because we're just kind of playing around. You know, no one's listening, so we can add whatever we want. <laughs> Thank um, you, and it's yeah. great to see you unmasked. But we're about to see you perform with your mask on uh, on the stage of uh, of the Herb Theater in in San Francisco, together with uh, PBO's chamber players and more selections that the Richard. Uh, prepared with you for this occasion, John Dallin, uh, uh, Tafo Consort. Uh.
This is a sort of like a Zoom dream come through, come through really. Uh, Varetsky Pass. Uh, um, we, we're, we're really trying to, to dream up what, uh, what uh, a, a program based on these synergies that as we continue through this program, hopefully seem more and more 
uh, obvious to our audience and not just to us. Uh, the idea of music produced for the table as music to, for listening that combines different genres and in a way acts as a cross-cultural and, and, and a cla bridge across uh, social classes uh, in, in the early modern period up to the, the up to modernity. And that's, those are the repertoires that Varesky Pass really uh, deals with. As we close this program, what are you offering? What are you putting, so to speak, on the table? So what we're going to do now is we're going to do something that's actually called a Tischnigen, a table niggin, and collected by um, Moshe Beragovsky, a Soviet ethnomusicologist in the early 20th century. And then another niggin that takes the theme of that, but turns it into more of a dance style tune. Now, very likely it wouldn't have been danced to because it only has the range of a vocalized tune. And this is a vocal tune for untrained people. It's people who sit around the table and sing. So very common that a uh, tishnigan, a table tune, will then start to get faster and faster. So that's what we're going to do here. Okay. And thank you all very much. And here we go. Well, just uh, stay with us because we may yeah. have some, actually, I wanted to invite the audience to Absolutely. post some questions. We will have a couple minutes for, for, for a Q&A. So if you have if you have any questions that come in from the audience, we'll answer them together afterwards. Great. much. Thank you so Christine. much. Sigurdstein and, 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 and Josh Horst. It looks like we may have some other questions and uh, some questions uh, coming in. Uh, somebody earlier was asking whether we were going to um, expand on a specific Baroque klezmer repertoire, but that's not really, that was not really the framing of the, of the, of the program. Just as a reminder, what we presented today was 
trying to find synergies and hopefully we, we made our case uh, well enough about how the table is really a place for listening to music and for bringing different types of music together. And we find examples in Europe, both in, in the, with the aristocracy and, and in, the, in the context of, of the Jewish wedding and, and, and the Hasidic court. So uh, once again, uh, thank you Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra for hosting this program and providing uh, such a wonderful platform to experiment with new musical ideas based on, on old repertoires. Absolutely, Francesco, it's always such a pleasure and what another fun, informative, um, innovative um, uh, event that you, uh, you gave to us and, and to everyone um, listening. Cookie and Josh, it's such a pleasure to meet you and what beautiful music making. And Bill, thanks so much for joining us and boy, it was uh, great to, uh, to be in Herbst live listening to you and, and our other orchestra members perform. Um, it's, uh, it's so remarkable. Um, Courtney, would you like to say a few words to roll us out? Oh, I would. I, I, know, there are, <laughs> I know there are a few questions, or maybe not. Um, but I just want to thank Francesco again for putting together such a robust and fascinating program. Uh, and I want to thank our Philharmonia chamber players. It was such a joy to hear you. And Bill, thank you for dialoguing with us today. Gosh, it's been way too long. Um, really grateful to Richard for putting together a fantastic program and to Cookie and, and Josh, the Varetsky Pass. This has really been a treat for us, for, for our audience. And we've had just tremendous attendance today. And I would just ask all of you, please, please support Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra and Chorale so we can continue to putting on programs just like this. Uh, really just a delightful program. So you set the tone, you set the tone for the day. Um, I know that there were a few questions that came in and um, we're not gonna be able to get to them, but, um, but you can certainly email info at philharmonia.org um, and we'll be able to, uh, to shoot them out to, uh, to whoever is able to answer those questions for you. So, uh, so please do email us. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and you, uh, have a great rest Bye. of your day. This was a, a pleasure thank and an honor. Thank you, that was thank lovely. You. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Cookie and Josh. And thanks as always, Francesco. Thank you to Bill. And, um, and we'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.